Um, welcome on behalf of the Australian IDSI Steering Committee um, to this industry webinar today. Uh, my name is Julie Chikero and I'm the Australian Project Officer. I'm also the um, co-chair for the International Dysphagia Diet Standardisation Initiative. Um, I need to start first of all by um, reminding everyone on the call um, that we have got an anti-competition clause to follow. So the webinar requires participants to adhere to the standards required of Australian competition law. Um, and under that, Section 45 of the Competition and Consumer Act prohibits contracts, arrangements, understandings or concerted practices that have the purpose effect or likely effect of substantially lessening competition in a market even if that conduct does not meet the stricter definitions of other anti-competitive conduct, such as cartels. Okay, so with that said, we've got our outline here. So what I'm um, planning to cover over the next half hour or so um, is this information here, looking at a, an overview of the IDSI framework and testing methods, um, some information regarding manufacturer guidelines for labelling, um, time frame to implementation information in Australia, answering questions on moving forward from a regional to a global standard, and also some information about the comparison of the IDSI tools with other measures. So for example, things like the Bostwick and other con um, testing instruments, what information each might be providing. There should be a, a good amount of time at the end for specific questions. I am recording the webinar, so what I would ask you to do when it comes to questions is to um, type them in the chat box and I can read them out for you and then answer them. So what is ITSI? Um, the International Dysphagia Diet Standardisation Initiative actually commenced in about 2013 and by uh, November of 2015, um, we published the uh, ITSI framework that you can see there. So it is a global standardised framework providing terminology and definitions for texture modified foods and thickened liquids. It sits on a continuum of eight levels from zero through to seven. It's a colour-coded model. The colours have been chosen in order that they um, contrast with one another to make them suitable for people with colour blindness. We used um, considerable methodology to ensure that we have culturally neutral terminology. And the framework includes descriptors, testing methods and evidence documents for both the drink thickness and food texture levels. In Australia, we've got professional um, adoption here. The framework has been formally endorsed for adoption by the Dietitians Association of Australia, Speech Pathology Australia and the Institute of Hospitality and Healthcare. So ITSI includes uh, a number of detailed descriptors and testing methods. So while we've got um, each of the levels has a label, so for example, thin, slightly thick, mildly thick, moderately thick, extremely thick, etc. They are also accompanied by a colour and a number and then detailed descriptors. And those detailed descriptors are found in the, um, can be downloaded from the EDSI uh, framework website under the framework tab. The other thing that EDSI provides are some uh, objective measures as well. So to try and get around that concept of how thick is thick, how soft is small, so how soft is soft and how small is small. So we have um, specific tests that were specifically chosen to be simple, quick, portable and reliable. In fact, one of, our, um, one of the consumers coined the phrase that the testing can be done in less than 10 seconds. Whilst it's possible to perform those tests um, at every time, you won't actually need to do that at every time. And the tests are really most useful for initial staff training, for auditing purposes, for industry use to develop and test products, and then for kitchen use um, to develop and test recipes as well. So I'm going to go through the, um, the different testing methods in a bit of detail now. So the fork test uh, provides us with differentiation between um, moderately thick and extremely thick or liquidised and pureed um, as one, um, one element for those particular levels. It provides us with particle size measurements for level five minced and moist and is used for softness and size information for level six soft and bite sized. 
So if we start first of all with level six, soft and bite-sized, these are bite-sized pieces of food. Um, for adults, they measure 1.5 by 1.5 centimetres and for children about eight millimetres by eight millimetres. For this um, texture, we know that chewing is necessary, um, that you need tongue strength and control to move the food for chewing and also for swallowing. It should be possible to easily cut this texture just with the size, side of a fork. So for our testing methods for this, you take a bite-sized piece of food and then you push down onto it with the fork in order that the thumbnail turns to white and the food should squash easily and not return to its original shape. Now it doesn't necessarily need to come through the tines of the fork, it just needs to be completely destroyed, but not sort of just squashed flat. The rationale behind the... Um, the fork pressure test has a physiologic relevance as well. So we determined that when you do press your thumbnail um, so that it blanches to white, the pressure required to do that is around about 17 um, uh, kilopascals and that relates to the, um, has been shown to be similar to the strength required for swallowing. We also have a video here providing um, a demonstration of the particle size assessment. So using a fork and the thumbnail blanches to white, the pearl broccoli is a little overcooked there compared to this one where when you press down, the sample remains intact. So it needs to be able to break apart. ITSI includes chopstick tests because we were informed by our colleagues in China and Japan that forks are not always readily available and that chopsticks are more commonly used by consumers there. And then further to that in other parts of the world, uh, there may be places, for example, in, in South Africa or indigenous regions where cutlery is not used and instead finger pressure would be a more appropriate method of assessment. And the same principles can be applied. These videos are available on the EDC website under the resources tab. When we move to level five minced and moist, we're looking for soft and moist foods that don't have a separate thin liquid. Um, the idea behind these is that um, they should actually resemble a, a chewed bolus basically. So they're not going to be exactly neat particle sizes. So we've got in the framework, you'll see a measure of particle sizes of a four millimeter lump size for adults and a two millimeter lump size for children. So that's not necessarily that they need to be four by four by four millimeters exactly or two by two by two millimeters exactly because we recognize that when you chew a bolus that the, the particle sizes are not exactly those dimensions. Four millimetres by four millimetres um, by 1.5, for example, would be the maximum that you could look for with an adult there. And again, we have demonstration videos to assist. So this one's using a fork pressure test with meat a fork drip test to make sure that there are no separate thin liquids. A spoon tilt test to ensure that the bolus holds itself together, but it is not so sticky that it sticks to the spoon. And then we continue on with chopstick and finger pressure tests as well. As I say, each of these videos are available from the ITSI website. This is another example of a suitable minced and moist um, sample. And the reason I've included this one as well is to, to demonstrate with the Rizzoni pasta, for example, um, that it is four millimetres in two of its dimensions. The third dimension is slightly longer, but no longer than the 1.5 for adults there. 
Our transitional foods are foods that start as one texture and change to another when moisture is applied. So for example, saliva or water or a temperature change such as heat. Again, we've got chewing required, but it's only minimal chewing in this regard. And tongue pressure may be enough to break the food down after the food becomes moist or changes temperature. So the transitional foods can actually be used with level five, level six or level seven. They don't, however, form a level on their own. Moving through to extremely thick or pureed foods. These um, have no lumps. They do not require any chewing. They should not be sticky. They should hold their shape on a spoon and fall off in a single spoonful when it's tilted and hold its shape on a plate with slight slumping or slow spreading. So we're using the fork, um, fork drip test. It should hold its weight, hold its size above the fork. It may have a small tail below the fork, but it shouldn't dollop or flow continuously or drip continuously through the prongs of a fork. The Itzy Spoon Tilt Test is designed to look at cohesion, so the ability of the bolus to hold together and also adhesion or stickiness. So the, the reason why we want it to be able to hold together is for people with extreme difficulties in the oral phase. They don't have the tongue strength to bring the bolus together to, um, to form a bolus, so they need for the bolus to be already formed. They also need it not to be sticky because otherwise it will stick to the roof of their mouth or potentially the inside of their cheeks and cause a choking risk. So for safety, the bolus needs to be cohesive enough to hold its shape, but not sticky. So as you take a, a teaspoonful of material and turn it on its side and give it a light flick, you should see that the bolus comes off um, and, and holds itself together reasonably well. You may see a small amount of residue on the spoon. However, you should be able to see the spoon through the residue. And that's the case in the top set of pictures, but not the case in the bottom set of pictures where there is clearly a lot of residue left with the nut butter. So looking at our liquid testing, we had a real measurement dilemma here. We were challenged by um, our, our multidisciplinary team on the IDSI committee uh, from a nurse from the National Patient Safety Agency who told us that we needed to be able to measure um, at bedside in cafes where people took things without, the, without complicated measurement devices. So measuring viscosity using rheometers or viscometers is too complicated for kitchen use as a basis for classifying liquid thickness. So we needed something simpler, but that something that was also valid and reliable that would measure thickness at the point of use. What we settled on was an adjustment to the posthumous funnel. Uh, the posthumous funnel is used in the dairy industry and it measures um, liquid thickness uh, from an efflux model. So as the liquid flows out, it's timed. So what we did is we, um, we're using the geometry from the, um, from the posthumous funnel, but we've applied a, a timing to it. So 10 millilitres is applied within the syringe. It's allowed to flow for 10 seconds and then the amount remaining in the syringe afterwards is read off to provide a li liquid thickness level. So the geometry allows for both shear um, and also elongation rheology that more closely matches the conditions within the oral cavity. So as I mentioned, the EDSI flow test, we use 10 millilitres of liquid dispensed into a 10 millilitre syringe. You release and time and stop it after 10 seconds. It is quite important, however, to check that you have the correct syringe Otherwise, there will be variations in flow um, and variations in results as well. So the syringe you choose to use needs to measure um, 61.5 millimetres from the 0 to, to the 10 mil line. So our moderately thick liquids have 8 to 10 mils remaining after 10 seconds of flow. The mildly thick liquids have 4 to 8 mils remaining after 10 seconds of flow. And the slightly thick liquids have one to four mils remaining after 10 seconds of flow. In Australia, we're probably most commonly um, familiar with uh, the mildly thick, the moderately thick and the extremely thick liquids. The slightly thick liquids are more often used in the paediatric population as they need to be able to flow through an infant teat or nipple. 
They, um, there are some uh, palliative care services, however, and cancer care services that do use this level of thickness. So you may see requests for this in the future, or at least recipes, um, in order that people can make up those um, those levels. So I mentioned um, about the, using the fork drip test to differentiate also between um, moderately thick and extremely thick. So with our moderately thick liquids, if you have um, exactly 10 mils remaining and it's not flowing through the syringe or you've got one to two um, drips through the syringe, it's important to make sure that it it's also meets the requirements of the fork drip test. So a liquidised fluid will have a, a small amount above the fork, but it will be flowing um, or dripping through the prongs of a fork. It would be difficult to eat this liquid with a fork because it would be dripping through it, um, as opposed to a, a pureed or extremely thick liquid where the liquid will sit in a mound above the fork and just a small tail may initially um, fall through but then hold within a couple of seconds. So one of the questions that we've been asked about the, um, the IDSI objective testing measures is how they um, correlate or, or um, translate to other testing methods that perhaps people are more familiar with. And I've had um, lengthy discussions with uh, Dr. Ben Hansen, our mechanical engineer on the, um, e the IDSI board around this, and he reminds us of a couple of things. So first of all, that foods and drinks have many dimensions, and each of those dimensions can be tested using one or more measurement techniques. And there's not usually a direct map between different measuring techniques. And I can give a, um, a, a different example here. So if you were to present to the doctor to measure your chest infection or investigate your chest infection, for example. The doctor might start by listening to breathing changes as an indicator of what's happening with your lungs and may then choose to follow it up with a chest X-ray. Now, both of them are valid measures, but one won't necessarily map to the other one. We can also use some other analogies as well. So the rheometer, for example, uh, provides us a very specific measurement of just thickness at a specific speed of movement, so usually at 50 reciprocal seconds. However, swallowing shear rates vary from about five through to a thousand reciprocal seconds. So we're really getting a point in time piece of information from the rheometer. You would also, if you're going to adequately classify a liquid, for example, to test all aspects of the liquid, you'd also need to do testing for density, for yield stress for, and for surface tension to fully describe the sample. And as, as an analogy, your rheometer provides you with um, information that might be akin to if someone were cycling, giving you um, information about the pedal cadence or rate. The ITZY flow test, as I mentioned, um, because it, it utilises the, um, the posthumous funnel geometry, captures information not just from shear, um, and it does that from the 0 to 1,000 reciprocal seconds, but also from elongation that more closely ha um, occurs during swallowing. It also captures information about yield stress and surface tension, and this information uh, will be presented in a poster by Dr. Ben Hansen this week at the European Society of Swallowing Disorders. So in this case, if we come down to our cycling analogy, the EDC flow test is probably giving us more information that's more similar to what a time trial course might do that includes your flat regions as well as your hills. So whilst they're similar, they're not exactly the same and can't be exactly mapped one to the other. If you're looking for more technical information about the Bostwick, for example, uh, rheology and the EDC flow test, um, I can suggest that you look at uh, Dr Enrico Hattie's University of Queensland PhD thesis that's available through the UQ library. Um, and in fact, if you Google it, you can pick it up as a, a PDF there. There are further papers in press from other research groups that you'll see um, published later this year. And also, as I mentioned, the conference proceedings from Dr Hansen's um, poster and uh, no doubt a, a journal publication as well. So that's liquids. If we turn to look at, um, at foods and most commonly here, um, a food texture analyzer, there aren't quite as many different types of machinery um, used for, for food texture analysis. So a food texture analyzer is the most common one used there. So it doesn't measure cohesiveness, which is one of the things that we have determined um, looking through the systematic review and looking through choking risk data that's really quite important. Um, and it also has poor correlation with sensory information. 
The IDSI fork, drip and spoon tilt tests are empirical tests, but they're designed for point of, um, point of view safety for cohesion and adhesion. When we're asked how do we map and, and what is the best way for manufacturers to, um, to take the IDSI information and to apply it in a manufacturing setting, I guess I would turn the question back around and ask you how you're currently taking your ideal sample from bench to production for scale up. So if you come up with a new recipe at the moment before IDSI came, uh, came about, how were you moving from something that you had in a glass, for example, to production? What we're asking you to do, I guess, is to use the IDSI testing methods to make sure that they're suitable there and then use whatever methods you currently use to map or to move from bench testing to production. And similarly, whatever testing methods you use in manufacturing for quality assurance purposes, um, we would imagine that they would still be suitable. I am happy, um, as I say later on though, to, um, to ask for information about what manufacturers are using for their quality assurance purposes. So in terms of mapping um, to IDSI from the Australian standards through to the international standards, um, we have a few changes. So as I mentioned earlier on, we have the new thickness level. We have a new numbering system um, that was most suitable to, um, to all of the stakeholders that were surveyed. And we have different colours. And as I mentioned, the international framework has been designed with red-green colour blindness in mind. Uh, and a change to the colour system um, as well from what we're used to with the Australian system and, and this is the same throughout the world. In terms of mapping to IDSI for foods, as I mentioned, we have a new texture description of transitional foods that we've talked about. We move to numbers rather than um, the letters that you see in the Australian system and we have a new texture level of liquidised. So some suggestions in terms of for manufacturing, which I'm sure a number of manufacturers have already commenced this process well and surely. So that's looking first of all of what your current uh, foods or, or thickened levels are and comparing them to the IDSI detailed descriptors and also to use the IDSI testing methods to see how they map. Um, it's possible to create an Excel spreadsheet. This particular one was provided by the Veterans Affairs Hospital. I am in the process of creating an, um, a fillable Excel spreadsheet that will, uh, for Australians, that will go up on the um, BEDC website as well so that you can put your products in there, um, write down the texture on the label, work out what the serving, the intended serving temperature is, and I'll talk about that more in a moment. Um, trial over at least two trials and then a third is a tiebreaker if that's needed if you've get, you're getting any variation. If you're getting more than one milliliter of variation then a third trial is recommended there. Um, we do have audit tools that are also available on the EDC website and they also provide the both the critical information as well as the, um, the preferred information if you like for the different texture levels. Working out um, where the where people are going to do their testing um, and the timing for testing. So although on the um, the audit sheets you'll see time of service 15 minutes and 30 minutes after serving, um, they are suggestions. The most important one there is the time of service. If you wish to know what happens with your product, so for example, if you intend to serve it chilled and um, if it's served in a hospital setting and you know that um, patients may be called away to a physiotherapy session or something and, and the, the thick liquid might sit there for 15 or 30 minutes and you want to know how it might behave over that time frame, whether it still will meet requirements after sitting for 30 minutes, this, this merely provides you with information that you can provide to your consumers about how they need to manage your product um, so that you can um, provide them that information. In terms of product labelling, um, we have information again that's on the website, but I've, I've got that here as well. So we have some recommendations for our industry partners. So you're welcome to use the IDSI labels once you've tested your products and you're confident that they meet the IDSI descriptors and testing methods. We recommend that you include a statement to indicate that testing has been performed either by your own company um, and, and we've got some suggested wording. Um, so being careful about claiming that products meet IDSI standards, for example. So we've suggested um, you, you're welcome to use the IDSI triangle labels and we've got those available as zip files. I've also got them available in AI format as well as JPEG 
um, uh, formats as well. On the next um, slide after this one, I've got the ITSI colour guide, colour guide that's got the RGB, CMYK and Pantone information. Um, we suggest that you have a, a statement on there that might say test performed by, so uh, for your own your own company name would go in there and that's perfectly reasonable. Um, and then in terms of other wording designed for or suitable for use with the EDSI framework, um, you're also welcome to include the website on there and also welcome to um, use the translation information of the EDSI labels um, and those are available on the website as well. As far as product labelers, labeling is concerned, um, for safety, IDSI recommends using at least two of the three IDSI descriptors, and that's at your discretion which two of the three that you use. So the, the three methods that we see that the IDSI labels are um, identified are by labels, so the actual words, the number, and then the colour as well. So as I mentioned, the test can be performed by your own company or by a third party. I'm aware that the University of Sydney, for example, offers some testing there. ITSI itself does not offer product testing or endorsement. Um, and if you'd like further information about third party testing, please contact me via email. The, this labelling guide is available from the resources section on the ITSI website. We kindly ask though that manufacturers do not include the logo or the actual framework image. Uh, because it might mislead um, customers to perceive that the products are uniquely endorsed or certified by Etsy. Where there are companies um, that are proud supporters, they have a, um, a slightly different logo that is suitable for use, however. So this is the uh, the Etsy colour um, colour code information, uh, and again, this is um, can be downloaded from the resources section there. These are some examples from um, companies overseas that have kindly shared their transition labels with us. So this one from Simply Thick, moving from the US from the honey consistency, they're using dual labelling where they had honey and also moderately thick and then transitioning across simply to moderately thick. And then this one um, from Hormel where the, it's far more subtle, uh, where you can see that just the, um, the triangle and the wording has been applied alongside the current um, US labelling system. So I have also some suggestions here for manufacturers, um, instructions for consideration only. So uh, because we know that the flow test is actually quite a sensitive device, um, it may be important for you to stress to, you, um, to your customers that they might need to level their scoops, for example. That information may already be on um, your information, but uh, I think in manufacturers of, of thickened liquids know that if you provide just a little bit more because you haven't leveled a scoop or, or um, if you've added a little too much of the liquid thickener, it can certainly change the thickness level. So reminding people to, to mix the way you intend them to mix as well. Um, also, your intended serving temperatures are important there as well. Um, as I mentioned, the flow test is sensitive enough to detect changes in the thickness associated with temperature. So if you intend for a particular um, drink or a soup, for example, to be consumed at a particular temperature, chilled or, or heated to provide that information. And then it's important to educate your consumers about on-label and off-label use. So your on-label use would be where people have in fact followed your instructions for mixing, your serving temperature, um, and potentially even information on the need for supervision while consuming. Now, if consumers choose, if you've recommended that the your um, thickened liquid, for example, be consumed chilled and um, the consumer has it in their handbag for the day and pulls it out at the end of the day and it's room temperature and they find that it's thinner than what they were anticipating, um, it would be quite reasonable to claim that that is off-label use that you had always intended that your product be consumed chilled. In terms of our labelling transitions, um, I thought it was important just to, to remind us that we're currently in the prepare stage. So that began in January of this year and will continue through until the 1st of May next year. So in terms of labelling transitions, um, for this prepare phase, what we're suggesting is that you prepare and um, educate your customers and 
um, consider dual labeling on your marketing material. I'm aware that um, certainly on the, the, the labels themselves on products are very expensive, but perhaps accompanying uh, marketing material could um, provide some dual labeling information. From about the 1st of May 2019, so there may be some companies that are ready to go earlier, there may be some companies that are ready to go you know, in May or perhaps in June, for example, that would be when you would introduce your ITSI labeling on packaging and also continue to use it on your marketing material. If you do become aware um, of people who've already transitioned across to ITSI only labeling, please do contact me. I was um, made aware uh, last month of a, a group in Western Australia who had started using um, ITSI only labeling and we were in touch with them to ask them to use, um, this was a, um, a health group, um, asked them to use dual labeling until May just as a safety precaution. Um, there are other resources that are available to assist industry as well. So we've got some um, implementation guide resources that have been developed and these are available on the EDSI website under the implementation tab there. You've got a master resource guide for the um, industry as well as for clinicians and food services. But then we also have an industry only implementation guide as well. And that's got just suggestions there on you know, your timeframes on stock transition um, and, and those sorts of things included in there as well. They are just a suggestion and uh, we expect you fully to, um, to, to work out what works best for your um, company. This is the information that we've provided to consumers in terms of risk management with the change to prepackaged labels. So we've told them that they need to expect a changeover period. We also tell them that for other legislated label change initiatives that a two year time frame is common. Now that two year time frame um, probably began when we first started talking about EDSI. Um, we've also told them that many manufacturers have indicated that they're changing their labels in order to be ready for the 1st of May 2019. We've also told them that the label changes are voluntary in much the same way that those packaging accessibility changes to meet the arthritis guidelines are voluntary as well. Um, we've also let them know that if they want specific information about when a particular manufacturer is changing their labels, we've asked them to contact you directly on when your product labels will change. It's been great to see uh, some of the, the new product label um, labels on people's websites. The Australian Nancy Steering Committee um, has looked at a range of um, managing risks with implementation and the change for the colour green um, for our uh, mildly thick and extremely thick has been identified as one of those. Um, so the transition labels or transition information there is going to be important for that, educating our stakeholders and training for food service staff in particular. And we're all responsible for that. Our label change um, changes we've discussed already. Um, and again, we're providing information um, to clinicians, food service and catering staff as well. Our general awareness is coming through from the steering committee and the project officer. We're developing educational materials such as this webinar um, and other educational platforms. And we've also provided information about the transition periods there. In terms of tender documents uh, by different facilities and health services, they're going to be managed by individual service facilities. There may be clauses if, um, if there are tender arrangements that are um, going to change over where the 1st of May will be included in that time frame. There may be clauses that will cover the change to ITSI included in new documentation there. Um, these are, uh, there are various sticker JPEGs that are available from the EDSI website that you can let um, customers know about. So if they're wanting to, um, you know, label prepackaged drinks, for example, to start their education process sooner, they could print out a label. So this will soon be called um, to help their um, food service and catering staff become familiar or, and patients become familiar with the new um, terminology and colouring system. Some suggestions for managing consumer expectations during the changeover period. And this is, um, first of all, I guess to say that, um, to remind customers that ITSI is a global standard and the testing methods do reflect the global um, audience there. So whether it's um, a fork or a spoon that we use in many Western parts of the world, um, chopsticks often used in um, China or Japan, and finger pressure testing used in, in other areas of the world, indigenous regions, um, of Australia and Canada, South Africa, for example, as well. 
Also from that um, global perspective, the current ITSI levels represent the range that currently incorporates the variability that exists worldwide. Um, and so that's why there are those bands there. Also to remind um, con consumers that ITSI is a living framework. Um, and so that as valid, reliable evidence-based research is published, the framework will be adjusted to ensure that it remains best in practice. For um, manufacturers wondering about what's happening in New Zealand, just to let you know that um, New Zealand um, adopted ITSI on the 1st of January 2018, so they're already full force um, into adoption now. Very quickly, our resources, the ITSI website is the best place to go. We are constantly updating that section. The resources tab found over here. Um, provides a wealth of information. You've got posters in there, including information about what is ITSI and the flow test. We also have flow test cards and food test cards. These are business card size templates that are available for download and printing. They are copyright. However, you are welcome to um, print them out and um, provide them to um, customers if you wish. We had a question um, asked of us about when people would switch from um, paediatric to adult particle size with the food. Um, and the answer here is when um, children are physically big enough. So it's a little bit like the weight for changing car seat orientation. And the example we give there uh, for when those, the diameter of the trachea will have changed significantly, um, roughly puberty is a, um, a if you're looking for a, a rough age guide, I guess. So for girls, that's between 10 and 14 years, for boys between um, 12 and 16 years. Um, but we also recognise that there's a lot of individual variability. And so when doctors are happy to recommend that there's been sufficient, tr sufficient tracheal growth to minimise choking risk, it's, um, it's fine for um, those particle sizes to be changed from paediatric to adult sizes. Um, other information, the audit sheets, they are found under the implementation tab. There are lots of different levels, so important to click through. That's also where you'll find the audit sheets, um, the little JPEG files that I mentioned, and the abbreviations for food service um, and aged care, in fact, software systems as well. A reminder also that um, ITSI has a free app that's available on both iOS and Android platforms. Um, once you've downloaded the app, you don't need to continue to access data. You'll be able to access the videos, the framework, um, the complete testing documents, the evidence documents, all of those sorts of things as well, um, and the e-bytes. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen now and um, see whether um, there are any questions? Um, so I have a question here. Are we able to distribute these slides internally to our organisation? And the answer there is yes. Um, so I have made a, a PDF copy of those and I'm happy to email those. While you're perhaps thinking about questions for me, can I ask a question? And, and that would be around um, the types of um, testing that manufacturing most often uses for your quality assurance purposes as you scale up to um, to large batch sizes. Um, I've got a question here uh, in regards to liquid or powder, so for, um, for thickeners. Um, I'm thinking of oh, for batch testing, thank you. So did I mean liquid or powder for batch testing? Um, so when you, uh, I guess when you're doing your testing, um, I was thinking mainly of pre-thickened liquids actually, um, rather than um, thickener um, powder or or, um, or thickener liquid. So I have someone here who, um, a manufacturer who uses Bostwick for thickened fluids, um, but for thickened fluids are moving to, um, to the ITSI flow test. Um, as I mentioned, I am aware that there is a lot of um, work that's currently in progress, both from um, ITSI researchers as well as um, from individual research groups. So I think you're going to see a lot of publications um, coming out. I have another question here asking if there are any challenges using the syringe test or the flow test for um, what we currently have in Australia of level 900 or extremely thick. Um, and yes, there are. So the, um, the flow test 
um, there is a sealing effect there. So it's not actually suitable for um, extremely thick liquids. So if you, um, if you expect that you have an extremely thick liquid, you can go directly to the, um, the fork drip test um, where you dredge up um, a sample of, of liquid onto a, a four-pronged inner fork and look to see whether it holds, um, it should mound above and have a small tail below, it should not drip continuously through the, the fork. I was recently contacted by a, um, a manufacturer of uh, normal foods who had been seeking some information around particle size um, for use in um, preparing uh, food for, um, for children who was uh, very complimentary about the um, the detail and information that's been provided by IDSI on the um, the particle sizes and the testing methods um, from a food perspective. Um, I have another question here. Do, um, are manufacturers able to release the new labels to the market prior to the 1st of May? Um, look, I think if they were released in, um, in April, so, uh, you know, leading into the 1st of May, um, that would be perfectly reasonable. Um, it, it's possible that there may also be um, international labels that may um, become available, um, whether those ones may already have um, ITSI labelling on them is uh, entirely a possibility. We're certainly providing information to people um, to ask as much as possible for those new labels if they're ITSI only labels as opposed to dual labels to come out as close as possible to the 1st of May. Certainly our clinicians are very keenly anticipating and looking forward to, um, to seeing the, um, the ITSI labels come out. We will also um, be releasing uh, patient handouts um, and they will also be available from the, um, the ITSI website. You'll be most welcome to, um, to download those as well. And once they're available, they're currently being trialled in New Zealand. We've received some fantastic feedback um, from them about the, um, the usefulness of them. Um, so we look forward to um, just tweaking them ever so slightly based on the feedback that we've had from the general support of the uh, clinicians and um, uh, people who require texture modified food and thickened liquids in New Zealand. So if there are no more questions, I'd like to um, thank everyone who attended for their time. Uh, and certainly if you if you think of any questions later on, please do um, contact me by email and I can be reached on australia at idsi.org. Thanks very much everyone for your time.